Okay. Kyle, how do you feel about taking this last group then, the class actors? Sounds good. Classes can be formed into relatively coherent social groups without there being any collective organizations acting strategically on behalf of those groups. In some historical contexts, such organized collective actors don't exist because of repression. In others, a variety of countervailing processes, ethnic, racial, linguistic, national, and religious divisions, etc., can obstruct the formation of organizations of collective class action. The explanatory relevance of class, some theorists argue, hinges on the extent to which class-based quote-unquote power actors emerge and confront each other in the various sites in which social structures are produced and transformed. Marx's famous assertion that history is the history of class struggle is the most extreme form of this argument. In this formulation, a fundamental part of the overall trajectory of human history is the formation of classes as collective actors whose struggles have the effect of transforming social structures. But even if one rejects this very strong proposition about the trans-historical importance of collective class actors, it is still possible to see the formation of class actors contesting for power as the central axis of class analysis. But even if one rejects this, a very strong proposition about the trans-historical importance of collective class actors, it is still possible to see the formation of class actors contesting for power as the central axis of class analysis. Probably a bunch of the stuff we, that we had just said is it probably belongs to this section. In terms of the sort of like, but what about, you know, this, this point about the history of class, history is the history of class struggle, is sort of like, a lot of what preoccupied history departments in uh, the mid 20th century of like Marxists trying to find collective class actors and then other non-Marxist historians trying to disprove their existence. Yeah. Yeah. See, this is the role of critical theory. You know, you're in the middle of thinking of why someone would choose a theory and then you, you know, while turning over what, you know, might be true or might be, a good idea for trying to analyze this objective thing, you then go, yeah, I mean, if you, if you assume that, then there's no, there's no real basis for hope in this direction, you know, like, yeah. Cause that's always the counter argument I would give to anyone, any Marxist, at least with this, you know, type of, uh, this thing is mainly an argument from bad consequences. Well, I mean, if that's true, then, you know, what are we even doing? What are, what are Marx even doing? If they're not like, you know, clarifying the class interests of the proletariat, more accurately, like by trying to formulate it in a self-serving way, like gum it up really hard and, you know, get people thinking about what it actually might be. I guess mm. you know, maybe, maybe the histor historical role of Marx is really. Because I don't know, when I think of, you know, there is no working class or something, I, I do think of the debates around communization and the more sophisticated debates that, really try to emphasize the existence of the proletariat and the way it engages in collective struggle without a class actor. And that's mm -hmm. some of the like the dankest, coolest like shit that, you know, I think Marxist theory has to offer in the 20th, uh, 21st century. It's just, you know, the idea that there is any, any reaching towards that collectivity at all that exists instead of just hanging up your head, admitting defeat. Well, it's really fascinating about that stuff too, is that like when, they take that line even further and say, okay, like the proletariat exists without a class actor and, you know, thinking about struggle and then getuning that line of thought of, well, what if we did have a class actor and it was something like workers councils or whatever. I don't think they use the term workers councils, but they talk about like, the need for like some kind of non Leninist organization and end up sounding more like good old fashioned left comms, you know? They have a more diffuse notion of the party than good old fashioned left comms, but yeah. Yeah, probably more akin to councilists, but although I don't even know if they would necessarily agree with that. Communization comes from a, like a critique of, of people that get obsessed with councils themselves as the highest like revealed form or something. I don't even want to appeal but, you know, to your class today. You know, importantly, class interest, I don't know, can exist without something acting on its behalf. And sometimes, I don't know, like sometimes is made very visible by something acting against its interests. <laughs> like, it's so obvious if you ever yeah. spend 
free time with like management. You yeah. Know? Like the things they get spooked about despite <laughs> there not being a collective actor on the other side. It, well, that, it, it is a little heartening, right? How fearful authority figures can be of the emergent process because there's no obvious class actor on the working class side, but they're afraid one's going to pop up out of nowhere. And without their fear, it looks like a very stupid thing to like put stock in. It's, um, it, it's, it, I've experienced this firsthand. It was incredible. So I worked at Target when I was about like 17, 18. This is like towards the end of the Bush era. And there's these couple of like libertarian bro bros who are defensive of, of Bush they would often bring up politics and that was like this little anarcho lib. And so I would always be debating them, but they were the, always the ones bringing it up. But because I kind of signaled my left leaning politics, me and this like absolute, like cute Stacy girl ended up being sat down and forced to watch this like anti-union propaganda. And this was before the kind of resurgence of like the albeit limited union activity and like labor activity we see lately. This was well before anything like that was going on. And I was just kind of like, what? And then me and this girl just ended up talking about our sympathies with social democracy anyways. (laughs) It was so bizarre. But, like, neither of us were, like, trying to organize a union. Like, we we were fucking kids. We didn't know how to do that. You were shown a propaganda film at work. Somewhere in the back of your head it said, a working class hero is something to be. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's kind of wild. Like, I don't know, like, if you could do that in Europe. I just don't even know if you can show an anti-union thing. I've never really heard that of it. It should be happening. illegal. I think it's probably illegal in Ireland. Or, I mean, just generally in Europe. I kind of, it it's kind of be. shocking to, to get that at work in America, you know. America's shocking, Tom. I don't know if you knew that about know, us. I don't know if that's true, though. They also do that shit in Canada, of course. Do they? Yeah. Yeah. I find it, maybe they do like hear about it. I, I've never heard of it. I've never met somebody who, who told me about it, which is kind of, yeah. No, it's yeah. fairly common in like big, bo- what we call big box stores. The irony is they, if it wasn't for this chud, and here's the funny part too, those conservative chuds at work, they'd often, because um, one of our managers was gay, they'd often like run afoul of management even, even though they were defending it's one of those weird ways in which, like, people's personal lives and their, like, I guess what we would call class location come into conflict. You know, the the guys who wanted to duck sick, duck sick, <laughs> suck dick uh, for their bosses. Duck were... sick? I want <laughs> duck sick for my bosses. <laughs> that's a Charlie Chaplin film. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Marx Brothers. Yeah. Hey. Oh, yeah, they, they would run afoul of their... You know. Foul, a foul, hey. <laughs> oh, God. Right, uh, we're going to the next bit. Okay, I'll do this one. Now we're on to Michael Mann's general approach to his class analysis. Organizational materialism, that's the name of it. Okay, so Mann takes a fairly extreme position within the spectrum of possible approaches to class analysis. In his view, class analysis should be almost entirely concerned with the formation of classes as collective power actors. To understand this view, we need to first outline man's general approach to the study of social structure and social change, what he terms organizational materialism. This consists of a conceptual menu for the study of power and his foundational proposition about power and society. Okay, let's have a look at this conceptual menu. So man's framework of the study of power involves two clusters of concepts. One, a typology of substantive sources sources of social power. That is a hard one to say. Substantive sources of so, substantive source <laughs> substantive sources of social power. Okay. It's like a vocal warm up. Uh, she sells, she sells. Substantive so sources of social power. Substantive so sources of social power. The seashore. She sells seashells down by the seashore. Uh, Okay, Uh, one, ideological power, two, economic power, three, military power, and finally, four, political power. These four power sources are not like billiard balls, which follow their own trajectory, changing direction as they hit each other. They entwine with their interactions, changing one another, one another's inner shapes, as well as their outward trajectories. 
Okay, and two, an inventory of forms of variation of the organizations that deploy these sources of power. These forms linked to these sources of social power are expressed as dichotomies, collective versus distributional power, extensive versus intensive power, and authoritative versus diffused power. So I, I like the idea of thinking of this as a menu, right? Like I just imagine I'm going to a drive to Welcome to Substantive Social Powers. Social Power, how may I take your order? Yeah, I'll have uh, I'll have uh, the number one ideological power with a side of political power. Does the military power come with political power? Oh, I'm sorry, that special is over. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, it's, it's after 11 o'clock. We're not doing breakfast. This, I, like, I don't like this. This is the thing that I, I, I kind of, I, I really didn't like in it, uh, where it doesn't kind of talk about what is the primacy, you know, of, so like the Marxist concept of economic power is the, you know, drives the, these other, the, these other things. It's the, it's the motor of these other types of power. And uh, like this idea of how they intertwine and they, how they interact, change one another. I, I feel that it misses like the core idea of, you know, the mode of production driving the superstructure. Even from a less deterministic Marxist point of view, these are all categories that probably have significant intersections. Right. Military like, power and political power, economic power and political power, ideological power, like political power, economic power. Target showing you an anti-union video is, you know, how many of these does that fall into? Right. It yeah. looks, I think it's like economic power with a side of ideological power. It's a number two. As, as far as like liberalism becoming totalitarian in the way that the Frankfurt School kind of like lays it out, it doesn't get much better than anti-union propaganda like at your job. I mean, I, I, I do agree with Tom's criticism ultimately. Like to me, these things are all interdependent and it's not as, it's like the more like kind of vulgar Marxist formation of like everything is about the bourgeoisie and blah, blah, blah. Like even if you don't buy into that, like, like it's just the dominant overall dominant thing is the economic basis. You know, not to say that the ideological and the military and the political power can't interact back on the economic power and change it and everything, but the overall driving major force is that. And these are, you know, if you were to write the maths equation, it would be the highest, you know, most Im impactful thing if we we're going to talk about power would come out of economy, you know even though the others can have like second order, third order effects back onto the economic power. Like that's just the well, way I understand it. And I don't understand, I'm not talking about it in a crude way, like, you know, like economy no. drives everything, but just overall from a systemic, if we're to describe this, to structure the system, that's why I don't like this. I I, I feel like, I don't, you know, I've said it before, I won't say it again. Well, when I was thinking about my problem with it, I, the, the only, the best way that, the thing that came to mind was like, okay, well, what if there was, what if one of these besides the economic power became super important? Like, let's say there is a military coup, right? The rest of these social power categories would be in service of maintaining that class of military brass that took over society. And it would serve the interests of that class of people. And it would shift the economic power right but to the extent that like the economic structure of the of the society was badly affected by this new military power that got power in the coup say to the fact that it was detrimental to the economy the military would find it difficult to maintain their their hold on power yeah i mean i think Kind of like in terms of like if you, you want to take like a really extreme example right you could look at like the mongol empire it's like the Mongols were in a backwater. Their economic production in absolute terms was minimal. But because of a change in ideological power and political power, they were able to actualize military power and conquer a very sizable portion of the world. Mm -hmm. But then if you look into, well, why were they able to do that? there is an economic basis to that in their way of life and the military affordances it gave them. 
It's not like they were just good at fighting. The way they fought was intimately connected to their economic way of life. And, and so I think that, you know, you can kind of get to this economic foundation for any one of these things, even if the, e the economic dimension is not really the obviously active dimension, because that's usually the case, right? Like when you have a group that takes power without a like, you know, strong ideological and political conception of themselves or, you know, some military basis, they're usually not able to do that. And it, it's really that like crystallization of the group as the group and having this like huge esprit de corps and being able to, you know, affect social reality in a big way. That is the, the big obvious thing. Of course, behind that, there is an economic base that makes it possible. And it's usually tied up with those other forms that you see. Like you don't get like a political form that is utterly divorced from the economic basis that it, it has. Something that's unique about modern society is this, like a concept of the economic that's hugely divorced from the political that might've had some independent existence in history, but conceptually speaking, those things are pretty tied up. And I don't know, you can even avoid any categorical, like, all right, we're going to just assume these categories are real, even though we're just carving up reality. You could avoid a categorical, like claim of always everything being determined by economic power. Like a stupid example is, you know, why is there nine candles on the menorah? Like instead of, you know, 11 or, you know, seven. But like a, lo a lot of things in history have weird contingencies that aren't obviously settled by the types of causality that economics in all of its power can emanate. There are limits, like oh, there's but limits to what, you know, sanctions can achieve with the, the Russia's invasion, for instance, like. Well, I think part of the problem with this typology is that it's not simply economic that is the kind of dominant form of power, but it's, it's, it's class relations. And I think like that isn't captured by simply saying economic, it's captured by some kind of, in, the, 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 the real truth is in a version of how these intertwine. Like in that, you know, military coup version, like, yeah, they'll lose popular support if they can't provide economically for the people that they govern. But more than that, like the power structure works in service to this new military class that's emerged. That's the main thing in that, in that society. But yeah, like it's, you know, this is something that Marx brings up in, I think it's like Capital Volume 1, Chapter 1, right? Where he talks about how like, this idea of ac economic power as determinative is something that only could arise in capitalist society because of the advent of um, market crises, where there is no, there's no one clearly in charge, but this economic thing is reshaping the world in big and chaotic ways. And then from that, you can kind of go back and be like, oh yeah, like, you know, even if there is a military coup, this person gets in power, et cetera, et cetera. Like, you know, if you look at feudal society, there is an economic process that was undermining the power of the nobility over the long term, that kind of argument. Right. So so what do we make of these, the second section, second part here of the forms of variations of the organizations, collective versus distributional, extensive versus intensive? authoritative versus diffused power. What do people make of this? I feel like these, this wasn't explained well. In the it book. wasn't explained at all. Yeah. At all, yeah. yeah. Yeah, not really. Yeah, it okay. seems pretty weird not, he would actually bother putting it in there if he doesn't even literally give you a description of what they are. Yeah, it's like, I can guess at what these mean, but I can't really give a strong opinion about it because it's like, it's it's just, the, those like the words that are here in the slide are the words that were on the page and there's nothing more to it than that. It makes so me what, think of like a character creator in like a Bethesda RPG game. Like, you know, you slide over to the authoritative slider to make your character more authoritative. And if you want to be more diffuse. Well, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. Maybe we should just guess like 
because I think like collective versus distributional, that is sort of, that's like how centralized like class power would be or um, extensive versus intensive, extensive meaning like if it means what it means elsewhere, you know, how much of the class does it have in it versus is it like a vanguard party with an extremely high demand or is it like, a, you know, the DSA or it's, it's extremely like low, <laughs> low commitment or low kind of social power or something in terms of intensive authoritative versus diffused, how hierarchical of an organization is it? Like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't know, like you, the first and the third seem to be kind of overlapping there. They all seem to be overlapping, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the, the second one has like something potentially interesting in terms of external limits and internal limits. But <laughs> other than that, I'm this not really sure why it's here. come up again. Really? I, yeah, I don't know why it's here. I, I really, again, I, I kind of really don't think he's interested in Michael Mann. That's why I think he doesn't explain it. I think he's interested in, he's interested in the class, class actor kind of specific focus, like sociology and why he thinks that's insufficient. And he's also interested in the concept of like segmentation, which he goes into in the next section. But yeah, I, I don't know why he just sort of lists it and moves on. Esri, how do you feel about taking this one? Feeling great. So, power organizations determine the structure and transformation of society. The structure of society is at its core determined not by culture or values, nor by the rational choices of individuals acting as individuals, nor by the property relations within which people work, but by power organizations. Such organizations exercise power through their ability to shape and control values and beliefs create the parameters in which individuals make choices, and to enforce specific patterns of property relations. It is power organizations as such that are the fundamental determination of social structure in society. So when he says social structure, what do we think of that? Like, is power organization not a social structure? I mean, isn't it a bit of like a tautology because you could find the only things that are real as organizations and then saying that power organizations are the fundamental mm -hmm. determinants of social structure, which is composed entirely of organizations? Right. It, yeah, it's more of an axiom than it is. It's like an argument. So it's, it's sort of like, well... I mean, if you think the only thing that's real are these organizations, I guess so. <laughs> like well, the, the, I mean, last, the last section, the last sentence there is not so much an axiom, but a a deduction of the axiom. Go on. Well, is it not saying that the like he says the only thing that matter are power organizations, and then it's but then power organizations determine social structure, yet they are a type of social. They're a type. They're a subset of social structure. I mean, yeah. I guess. I guess the other reason. The other like reasoning here is that like all the other stuff that Wright is interested in maybe is determined by the power organizations or, or fundamentally determined in the same way that we were making fundamentally causal arguments for economics and all of these different examples with the Mongols and such. Like man, I guess, ultimately thinks the fundamental determinant of social structure are these class power organizations, which, you know, one can appreciate this when you're looking at the German constitution and, you know, however empty their, you know, corporatist like labor puts a rubber stamp on legislation check is it's, it is built into the constitution. And the last time I checked, there was no such role for organized labor in the United States. Now, the question is, is this really like a fundamental determinant of structure? You know, pro probably not, because if, you know, you no. ask people about the German economy versus, yeah, even some places in Europe or, you know, the world that don't have a, as much of a, you know, maybe labor didn't have as much of a seat at the table in writing the constitution. Some workers are, you know, some sectors of the working class in different countries are better off than the, some are in Germany, like in terms of collective actor, <laughs> like, so... Yeah, I, I don't think. Yeah, I don't know. I think I think Wright gets into why this is a frustrating analysis later. I just think the key thing here is that, like, imagine a power organization that is in a double bind 
or a similarly confounding uh, set of decisions it can make or, or, or action potentials it can have. Yeah. Well, what's determining that? Is it just the other organizations? I don't think so. No. Well, perhaps, it'll, be, it'll be material perhaps, reality, won't it? But yeah. perhaps the, the power organizations, you know, constructed the the social like the social structure as such you know as I guess man's like man in the same way that we were arguing that the you know why did the Mongols invade all this and that's fundamentally economic man believes this about a social structure maybe not you know doesn't no no there's no rule there's no room for you know I guess geologic like <laughs> this reminds me of like the people who are like the president set the the price of gas too high. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so expensive. Biden did it all on the phone. Yeah. Well, how, how, let's. There's a smarter one for that, right? Uh, OPEC did it. You yeah, can but have, you can have that not, view of not borne out by evidence. Yeah. No, 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 no. But like this is, uh, <laughs> this, is, this is more. This is but that, but it's still like a smarter version, and you can you can understand why people will look at like the head of a cartel and be like, uh, "This is their fault," as opposed to diffuse emergent patterns, which are kind of harder to sense in a causal way. That's so you're telling dialectics is, is a thing. Are you telling me that the uh, school shooters then weren't actually done under orders at NRA? Is this what you're telling me? <laughs> Look, all, all I'm saying is that they, they could have somehow, you know, in the air, did the will of the NRA without the NRA telling them. They, they, they suck at what they do. They're not really good at actually defending gun rights, by the way. Yeah, they just get Republicans elected. Yeah, that's basically all that it takes us for. One small thing I wanted to add, too, though, is that, like, as, as like, a lefty person who has absolutely no power, there is a way in which this does, this theory does kind of appeal to me. I don't actually think it's true, but, like, lacking power, I'm like, yeah, we need social organizations to assert our power. Well, yeah, well, like... I, I, I certainly would say that social organizations have a preponderance of power, but I wouldn't say they're determinative of the structure exclusively. <laughs> like social organizations can really push things in a direction, but uh, yeah, the, this is, they're just, you know, as uh, Wright said here, like it's an extreme assertion of, of a plausible thesis, right? Right. Yeah, to yeah totally. Right, Esri. Oh, I'm, I'm reading? Okay. Man does not provide an extended meta-theoretical defense of his view. He believes that the empirical insights of his historical research provide the best defense of this model. Man's approach is a variety of what might be termed an agency-centered framework of social analysis. The central idea is that people act to achieve goals by deploying various kinds of capabilities. They can do this as individuals interacting strategically with other individuals or through their involvement in collective organizations. The creation, reproduction, and transformation of social structure is the result of such strategies. It is the collective organizational form of pursuing goals through the use of power rather than simply the interactions of individuals within social relations that is decisive for explaining social structures and social change. Organizations are able to much more effectively mobilize resources of all sorts in pursuit of goals than are individuals. They therefore have a much greater potential impact on the reproduction and transformation of social institutions. That right there, that right there is when I completely was done with man's theory. Because when I read this, I thought, you know, the, the idea that organizations are able to much more effectively mobilize resources of all sorts, I immediately realized, oh, man's never been in a leftist organization before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, organizations are somehow less than the sum of their parts. <laughs> yeah. In leftist organizations, it is true. Like, yes. we subtract from each other and divide until we crumble. Well, that's, that's not always been true, but yeah, just true. But like, you know. <laughs> that is it's funny. not always true. But often. Yeah, 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 definitely. 
at the moment. I mean, it's, it's, it's undeniably also, true of every single radical left organization probably in the world. <laughs> is that yeah. an exaggeration? Not much. Mm-hmm. That's why there's like I'm a right. bunch of... <laughs> There's 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 a whole layer of like burnt out internet lefties. Some of them probably were always looking to make their move and cash in, but a lot of people probably approached the left with good intentions and got turned away being more conservative than they might otherwise have been. Not not crazy to me. So I don't know. We're we're talking about we're supposed to be talking about organizations that are uh, that are class organizations, and I guess. <laughs> A class conscious organization. So maybe the most craven of the Leninists that realize they want to create a new ruling class. Um, <laughs> maybe class conscious uh, middle class people, I suppose. But you know, <laughs> most Mar- Marxists like to flatter themselves, but they're not doing that. So they get confused. So I guess maybe that goes some way towards why these organizations are so dysfunctional. Um, when he says man does not provide an extended meta theoretical defense, what when he says meta theoretical here, what is he talking about? What is the theory that explains the theory, right? Like what what justifies the argument that you know power organizations are the determinants of social structure? Yeah, you know, cool. why this theory rather than another? Isn't this body of evidence also consistent with other theories? Yeah, so we go to the last slide because we've kind of talked about the general critique is like power organizations, yeah, they're important, but like they're not all that, right? Yeah, and like you can like get like the Burian analysis of organizations to see like why they're fucked and self sabotaging and actually do not, uh, they, they do not act as a power multiplier for their members. Right, to keep on, keep on uh, <laughs> going into defecation mode. <laughs> I really like that part of uh, beer where he talks about like what is it like fourteen different modes of behavior that they've analyzed and like and you know we can look at leftist organizations as jumping between defecation and like fucking sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Oh, wow, that's uh, it's like. Cu- kind of resonates with the the Freudian use of excretory as like the purge instinct and as being related to, you know, like morbid violent like behavior to try to eliminate groups or people. Uh, That, that does, that kind of does kind of ring true actually. Yeah. I saw, um, what was it? Uh, There's a recent study done in the UK and it said that uh, something like one in 10 children in the UK right now is engaging in self-harm as a result of uh, the social stresses that uh, have been put on them because of uh, the rising cost of living. Uh, oh God. So that's that, uh, that per like that violent purging, right? Yeah. Uh, desperate situation. And directed inward. Yeah. Sounds about right. <sighs> yeah. That's a, a, extremely grim. Oh yeah. Um, Let's let's focus on something a little more sunshiny, like the, the the power organizations determining the structure and transformation of society. Yes, or as I'd say, of of society, right? Um, <laughs> you do like the double of. Fuck it, you know. I've typed I typed out these slides. There was twenty six of them. I think I did it in one day. It fucking it it absolutely broke my brain trying to do it. It's so boring. Okay, uh, Kyle, do you want to take this last one before we drop before we? I- Power organizations determine the structure and transformation of society. The struggle to control ideological, economic, military, and political power organizations provides the central drama of social development. The four power sources offer distinct, potentially powerful organization, organizational means to humans pursuing their goals. Man's general framework is similar to that of rational choice theory. People have goals and deploy resources strategically to accomplish them. However, he rejects the individualistic way of elaborating this idea by insisting that the core actors that matter in shaping the structured properties of society are not individuals as such, but individuals combined into power organizations. These power organizations deploying 
the four sources of power and varying along the three dichotomies of organization. Organization, no variation. Explain both the principal structural features within which individuals live their lives and the dynamic processes of large scale trajectories of social change. I think this kind of explains why beyond, you know, never being in a leftist organization, this explains why I think man kind of misses the point a little bit as far as what I was saying earlier about organizations don't always marshal resources in a more efficient way. If you look at how individuals behave within these collective organizations, you might see those sort of self-destructive purging behaviors. You could still argue that man would still be right when those groups aren't dysfunctional. And if man was faced with empirical evidence about this, maybe that's where he would go. Well, I think, I think a collective actor is necessary for the transformation of society, but the way in which he makes it the kind of sole determinant and the way in which he doesn't really, he has this blind spot about the individuals within these collective actors is I think where he kind of misses the mark. Well, I think he's not necessarily saying that collective acts, you know, collective organizations uh, necessarily like are working to change society in any meaningful way. Right. Yeah. No, but that's how that, that is what shapes society. It's not necessarily that they're, it's not like, Oh, from collective actors comes communism. No, it's like there's different collective actors. Right. That could be a mafia. Different classes. Yeah. You know, like, but it's more the fact that like, what actually drives he's saying that society you know, like dis dysfunctional organizations he's not making the case that they are doing it but yeah, when they yeah. when they cohere they're they are the the driving force as opposed to like you know the marxist conception or other conceptions of what is the driving force yeah these these types Fair of enough. power clicks he's engaging in the kind of like methodological collectivism that people uh, often accuse uh, hegelianism and marxism of this is actually the other thing I think Wright is probably interested in, right? Is that he, he's doing, it's similar to rational choice theory, but it's not individualistic. A lot of rational choice theorists are explicitly methodologically individualistic, but then they will do something like posit a collective, like national actor, like in an economy or something. And they usually won't provide any argumentation for why that's all right at least man has this, you know, this sense that this is a, this specifically is a type of actor that's so socially important that, yeah, you can basically defend a group geist, (laughs) like a group spirit, you know, group interest using this theory. For many one... (laughs) <laughs> it's not a, you know, the a real movie. actor is the is the brain meat slurry that uh, constitutes uh, the organization. Yeah, I thought for a second you had said, "What's the one? A- absolutum, obsoletum." <laughs> <laughs> if it works, it's out of date. That's the, the intro to the dedicate. Uh, what do you what do you call them? The intro of the brain, the firm, or maybe what do you call it when there's a line before a book? Dedication. Oh, What's dedication though. No, it's not. Oh. It's a uh, uh, tagline. Like, no. Oh, yeah, there is a specific word for this. Uh, or a pithy statement at the start of a text. Well, we'll figure it out like in five minutes after we stop recording. So don't worry about it. Yeah. All I have to say is all this talk about man's general framework. What about woman's general framework? You know what I'm saying? Hell I yeah. think that's, that chapter. I haven't read all the book. That's chapter six, isn't it? Oh, but which one? The next one? I'm joking. Jesus Christ. Uh, by the way, the word is epigraph. 